great start, I feel like. There was some great singing, you know. I feel like um, singing Father Abraham with a stomach full of lasagna right before you preach was not the best life choice, but, you know, I only have a slight headache. We'll see how it goes um, throughout uh, this evening. But this morning, I'd like, or this evening, rather, I'd like to talk for just a moment as we get started about... the other way perhaps that button no which button is it <laughs> it's right there. Oh. all right well we'll see if we can go on um, go into this so let's talk for a little bit about planning specifically the plan so if you watch a lot of action movies or maybe a lot of action TV shows, oftentimes there's a team of people. And in that team of people, there's one guy who's usually called the idea guy or maybe the smart guy. Maybe he's the leader of the team. Maybe he's you know the tech guy or whatever. Whatever the case is, there's usually one guy who's the guy who really comes up with a lot of the stuff, including the plans. You know, one show I found in my research, one I've seen a little bit of, was there is the A team? You know, one of the famous phrases by Hannibal is, "I love it when a plan comes together." This idea of a planner uh, involves a lot of different things. You don't just have to be smart or intelligent. You have to be knowledgeable, and more than anything, you have to be prepared when situations arise. You've got to be ready for a backup plan. You know, that's one of the key things about being a great military strategist. Um, This guy right here is an ancient Chinese general named Sun Tzu, and he said, to not prepare is the greatest of times to be prepared beforehand for any contingency is the greatest virtue. Whenever you're a good planner, you need to be prepared for anything. Well, this morning we're going to be talking about not just a good planner, but the perfect planner. Someone who definitely was able to prepare for any contingency because he knows everything. And that is, of course, the all-powerful and awesome God. Because he had a plan for humanity even when Satan tried to interfere. And that passage, that plan, is found in a prophecy. A prophecy that we will be going over this evening. If you don't mind, go ahead and open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. I really appreciated Brother Jonathan's lesson yesterday, and I, the thing I appreciated the most about it was how he connected all of these prophecies into a great story um, that all connect, <coughs> excuse me, that all connect to one another. And the beginning of that story is the first prophecy, which we went over briefly on Sunday. But I want to go over it in a bit more depth today. So starting off with our context, which is found in verses 9 through 13, where it says, But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman who you gave me, gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord said, God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Here we see the direct aftermath of Adam and Eve eating from the forbidden tree and in eating from that forbidden tree they gain knowledge and they realize that they are naked and so they clothe themselves and they hide from god they feel shame for what they have done and in doing so as they hide they are approached by god and he asks them the question where are you and then after that he asks you what they have done that who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? And at this point, the, Adam does something very interesting here. He says, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I 
8. I want to highlight this for just a moment. Humanity here has a major problem, a major problem of sin. But moreover, they have a major problem here right off the bat of playing the blame game. So just like um, Sunday, I would like it if we could have a little bit of discussion here. So the question that I have for us this evening is we too often play the blame game. What are some different things that we might blame? Some of the people that we might blame whenever we have problems in our lives. Our parents, that's a good one. Yeah, it's the way I was raised. You know, mom and dad didn't raise me right, or they told me that this was okay. What else? Who else might we blame? Blame the world. Say, oh, the world today. Yeah, oh, it's, oh, you know, it's just the people around me. You know, that's just the way things are. You know, our culture today, you know, it's just, it's so wrong. And I just can't go against the grain like that. It's just natural for me. Anything else? Sometimes you might even blame That's kind of what Adam does here. You know, Adam blames two people you might notice here in this passage. He does blame Eve, but even more so it seems that he blames God. After all, he says, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree. Adam's saying, hey, this wouldn't have happened if you hadn't have given me this woman, God. The reason I'm bringing this up is as we go through this lesson, we're going to tackle the idea of how the actions of Adam and Eve affected our lives today and how, despite the fact that we might blame any number of people for our problems, ultimately those problems are our own and can only be solved through the Jesus who we're going to be talking about in a little bit. And as we discussed, they are playing the blame game. As we move on, though, we get to the main portion of our text here, verses 14 and 15, where after talking to Adam and Eve, God decides to give three curses, one to the Adam and Eve, or one each for Adam and Eve, and also one for the serpent. And he starts with the serpent here in verse 14, where it says, The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock, and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. First, we find a physical curse for the serpent, that they will have to stay on their belly for the rest of their lives, and that they shall have to eat the dust. But what I want to discuss this evening is the spiritual curse and the prophecy that is there. You know, there's some different translations that pop up when talking about this prophecy. Some scholars have taken it to be a purely physical prophecy in nature, talking about the relationships between people and snakes, saying, ah, yes, you know, people and snakes, they don't like each other, and so that's just what God's talking about. And the uh, bruising of the head and the bruising of the heel is simply how the people react to the snakes, how they kill the snakes. And although there might be something to specifically how they would kill snakes in ancient times, that's not really what's being discussed here. Rather, we have a spiritual curse, a spiritual prophecy that is given here, the one we read yesterday and the one we're reading now. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. There is a clear note here of the fact that although Satan might attack the descendant of Eve, that he might, despite the fact that he might attack this person who will come in the future, that he will not win. He will deal a wound that is certainly not pleasant, but one that can be overcome. While, on the other hand, the man will give a deadly wound to him. So let's look at how this prophecy played out in Scripture, how it was fulfilled. If you don't mind, turn to the book of Matthew right quick. Matthew chapter 27, verses 45 and 54. We won't read all of this this evening, but I do want to touch on what occurred here. The person who was destined to destroy Satan had come. There are many prophecies, some of which we will discuss as we move forward in this lesson. 
And through this week, through this VBS, we'll discuss some of those prophecies. But all of the prophecies point to one man, that being Jesus Christ. However, despite this, many people do not see that Jesus is the Messiah. Many powerful people, that being the Pharisees and Sadducees, who are now using the Romans to put him to death. And part of that might confuse a lot of people in Jesus' day. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But before that, let us read here in the verses, starting in verse 45. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders heard it and said, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again and with a loud voice, and he yielded up his spirit. We'll go ahead and stop there. Now... For the Jews living in this day, this was not a man who looked like a Messiah. This is not a man who looked like he would slay Satan. You see, many of the Jews, many of the Pharisees and Sadducees included in that, they didn't expect Jesus. They expected a warrior king. There are many other prophecies, some of which even are written on this wall, which refer to the Messiah being the son of David. They see in these prophecies a powerful conqueror, someone who will drive out the Romans from their lands, someone who will physically deliver them. However, what they don't understand is by killing Jesus, they are falling right in to the plan. They are delivering the bruise to the heel, if you will, but Jesus in dying is delivering the blow to the head. One passage that helps explain this is found in the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. The entire book of Hebrews is a beautiful book. I encourage you, if you haven't already studied it, to study it thoroughly. Because it is a book that is all about how Jesus is better. How Jesus is better. How Jesus is the solution. Something that we need to know today. And here it says in verses 14 and 15, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that though, though death might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those through fear of death who were subject to him for lifelong slavery. Jesus is defeating Satan by Dying, not as a powerful king like many expected him, not as some wise sage even as perhaps many think of him, but as a sacrifice, a lamb to the slaughter. Another passage that hammers this home is also in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 9. I have verse 14 up there, but I would like for us to read from verse 11 where it says... <coughs> But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of his creation, he entered once and for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by the means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. This was God's plan to send his son for he so loved the world as John writes in John 3 16 and for that son to die as a sacrifice that his blood might save us from our sins as we read in Hebrews, Satan had one weapon, one weapon that could not be overcome by anything of man's. That weapon being death, the power of death, the power to trap us in our sins without hope of salvation. But God had the answer. Despite the fact that Satan would attack Jesus with his most powerful weapon, that being death, Jesus in doing so, would deliver the death blow to him, destroying 
death, destroying the power of death, and atoning for all of our sins. As we turn back to Matthew 27, we see that Jesus is buried. It says, When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him, and Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. And it says that Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite to the tomb. Further, in accordance to God's plan, Jesus would be buried. Buried in the tomb of a wealthy man, a supporter of his who wished to give him a proper burial. Far different from the burials that were normally given to those who had been crucified. And three days later, we will see the next part of God's plan, but I won't talk about that now. That will be discussed tomorrow night. However, as we look at this passage, as we see God's plan in action, and we see God's plan taking Satan's greatest weapon, that being death, and using it against him, I would like for us to discuss some applications now that we can take from this passage and that we can apply to our lives today. The first application is that sin has consequences. We see very clearly in this passage in Genesis that what Adam and Eve did had great consequences, not just consequences for them bringing sin upon themselves, but allowing a cycle to begin, a cycle of sin that entered every man, as Romans 3, 23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God allowing evil to enter the world. For us today, our sin also has consequences, but we'll talk about that in just a moment. The second application from this passage is that Jesus had to die. The sin of man was so great. It was a sin that was incompatible with God. It was a sin that was permanent due to death, and only someone like Jesus, as we read in Hebrews, could be someone who could break that curse. And finally, God's plan involved and still involves sacrifice. This is not a plan of conquering. This is not a plan of power. This is a plan of losing, if you will, giving up something. The plan of a servant, the plan of a sacrifice. But now let's discuss these concepts a little bit, and I'm not exactly sure when my time will be up. It's 6.33 right now. I think I go to 6.45. I think that's it. So good. We have a few minutes here to discuss. Here's our first discussion question. We talked about sin and the consequences that it brings and how the consequences of Adam and Eve's sin were great, so great that God's son needed to come. But let's talk about today for a moment. What are some consequences that can come into our lives because of sin? What are the consequences of sin today? I think a lot of times we talk about how it can personally affect us, but it also affects other people also. Um, our own sins have a damaging impact on others, and that even more so. Um, yeah, I think that's right. Not all sins necessarily have an effect on other people. We're not dealing with a situation here where sin is necessarily passed down. But our sin can have earthly consequences, earthly consequences that affect other people. I mean, obviously, we might think of sins that are punishable by our laws, you know, killing, stealing, doing things like that. Those are things that will bring consequences to you in a physical sense, but will also bring consequences to your family members. You know, you think about how. Um, easily children imitate their parents or imitate those who look up to them. Oftentimes, that is how sin can affect people. Children seeing it and thinking, ah, this is what I'm supposed to do, or this is okay, this is something I can imitate, when in reality it's the exact opposite of what they can be doing, or what they should be doing. What else? Separation from God. I mean, I, that's obviously just the same as it was back then, it is still today. It separates us from God. You know, God's love is a wonderful thing. It's an amazing thing. God's love is what allowed this whole plan to happen. But at the same time, 
God's love, despite all of that, God cannot be around sin. He doesn't want us to sin. God's love is why he, he cannot be around sin. And so whenever we sin, we separate ourselves from God, something that can only be solved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Very good. Anything else? I think in addition to that point, it's important for us to think about the fact that why sin has to have that great of a consequence. And it's because we are rebelling against God. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when God told Adam and Eve, don't eat that fruit, and they ate that fruit, they became rebels. And, you know, if, if some group here in the United States tried to rebel and, and rise up against the government, they would either lose their lives or they would be kicked out of the country. Those, those kind of people aren't allowed to stay in the presence of a leader because they are rebelling actively against them. And the same goes for us with God. That's why he, uh, Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden. Yeah, because they were rebelling against God. It's disobeying God, and that's I think that's a great point, Isaiah. Thank you. I think that another consequence we don't often, sometimes we think of, and I think you mentioned it briefly, is that the consequence of our sin is that Jesus had to die. I mean, that is probably one of the bigger ones that we can think of, that God had to come down as Jesus, and that it was because of our sin that that had to happen. I think that's a great point and you know this is a bit off topic but think about how that should motivate us you know part of the reason why we live as christians i think the biggest reason why we live as christians isn't necessarily always because of fear of something bad happening to us or something like that no rather we serve as christians in large part or at least we should out of gratefulness for god for what he did for us you know, he, we are the ones, it is our sins who are nailed to that cross, just as the same as the sins of the Pharisees and all of the people before Jesus were nailed to that cross. This is not something that, you know, we are free from. And so we should live in a way that shows our gratitude for Jesus' sacrifice. It's all great comments. Let's go ahead and move on to our second question, though. So, we talked about how Jesus is the only Savior involved that in this world. But in our world, we prop up, I think, a lot of other Saviors. That maybe we don't necessarily even think of them as spiritual Saviors, but it's people that we prop up. We say, ah, yes, this person can save us, or maybe ourselves can save us. What are some Saviors that we try to prop up in our lives instead of Jesus? Nathan? Money. Money, that's a big one. I just need to get enough wealth. That's what I need. If I can just get enough money, I'll be happy. My money will keep me warm and keep me fed in my old age, and, you know, I'll be, I've got everything at that point. That's good. What else? I think the government can be viewed as a savior sometimes, or whoever the, the ruling political party is. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's an interesting one. Yeah, we think, ah, yes. Those in charge in the government, they can solve all our problems. You know, we just need to trust in them. They can figure everything out. I think we all know, you know, that the government can't figure everything out. What else? One more. You briefly mentioned this, but it's ourselves. I, I didn't mean to cut somebody off if they were, they were about to say something, but we, we think that we can do things by ourselves when we can't. Yeah. What would you have? Yeah. Yeah, it's about the same thing here, but I think sometimes we... We look at it and go, oh, if I can only be good enough, if I can only do this, and I, and I can't. I can't be good enough. I'm yeah. definitely good enough, but God's blood of Jesus, all my effort amounts to nothing. I think that's a good point. You know, that's something we can do as well. What do you have? I think along a similar line, sometimes we have this tendency to rely on the faith of our family and the faith of others instead of our own faith in Jesus Christ. That's great, too. Back to what... Um, Jonathan and Isaiah said, I think something, um, you know, we talked a little bit about how we blame everyone else, you know, for our problems. And sometimes we can accept that blame. We could say, like, these are my sins. That's what I have done. But we also have this attitude of I need to fix it. I have to be good enough in order to pull myself out by my own bootstraps, if you will. That's impossible. Obviously, there are things we need to obey. There are things we need to do. But we can't get anywhere without the blood of Jesus. Amen. 
And that's something we have to understand. That's something we have to accept. If we're not accepting that, if we're telling ourselves, I have to be my own savior, you're going to fail. It's an impossible task. It's an impossible plan. Very briefly, I want to touch on this third question. I mentioned a second ago that God's plan involved sacrifice. And I think to a certain extent, we are still called to live sacrificial lives. You know, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Now, we don't necessarily imitate to the letter, have to intimidate, Im imitate to the letter what Jesus did in his day, dying on a cross, even though maybe we will be called to die for our faith one day, as many of the apostles were. But still, we're called as Christians to live sacrificial lives, to live servant lives. What does that mean to live a sacrificial life? What are some examples of living a sacrificial life? Yes. David asked the question, what shall I render to the Lord for what he's done for me? Then he answered himself. He said, I will take the cup of salvation to take advantage of Jesus' death. I think, yeah, that's good. I think something interesting with David is, you know, he's talking, you know, David is asking the Lord, you know, I want to build, you know, a temple to honor you. You know, can I do that? And God's like, no, I want your son to do it. You have blood on your hands. You have shed innocent blood, but you can prepare for it. You know, David, in many respects, sacrificed that glory of building the temple, but he still was able to honor God and do his part by preparing the right materials. What else? Sometimes it means that we give up our own rights for the benefit of others. That's, I, I'm glad you said that. That's, a, I think, the biggest thing. You know, Paul talks multiple times. He talks about it in Romans. He talks about it in 1 Corinthians 8, dealing with the issue of food sacrificed to idols. And that's obviously a first century issue at the time. But it gives a principle there, especially in that last part of chapter 9, where Paul talks about how he sacrificed his rights, about how he made himself all things to all people in order to save souls. You know, what are we willing to give up as Christians in order to help our fellow Christians, to save people? I think we should be willing to give up just about anything, at least in a physical sense. You know, for Paul's day, it was giving up meat. For our day, it can be any number of things. But that's something we need to be willing to do. We need to be willing to sacrifice. You know, we live in a world, we live in a country especially, and I love our country. But one thing that we, we have this idea of, ah, yes, my rights. These are my rights. I am an independent person. I have my rights to do my things, and I love our rights. But I think we get this idea sometimes that, you know, we can be selfish as Christians, that we only have to work, look out for me, my rights, my ideas. That's all I need to look out for, just me. That's not what we're called to do as all as Christians. We're called to look out for others, for other people. <clears throat> I think that's great. Got time for maybe one more if anybody's got anything. Uh, go ahead. You know, for our culture, I think one of the things that it means, what do I do with my possessions? Who's our, who's the deserve? You know, how, when, when is the last time we were going to give up something that we wanted for the benefit of somebody else? When's yeah. the last time I invited somebody who didn't have a meal out to eat instead of my friends? Or when's the last time that I had somebody that didn't have a place to stay and I let them stay in my house or you know th those possessions that we have are they ours or are we are we stewards? Yeah, I think that's a great point. You know, possessions, but I like how you talked about people as well. You know, we have to think, oh, you know, I, I can serve these people. These people I like over here, but these people over here, eh, they're they're kind of weird. I don't really like them much, you know. We just we don't get along, you know, we're, we're we grind together like sandpaper. That's what we think in our minds. So we think, oh, I don't have to serve them. I don't have to, you know, do godly works. I don't have to, you know, share my blessings with them. I don't have to interact with them. That's the opposite of what we need to be doing. Those are the people who we need to be reaching out to, even if it's difficult, even if it means a little bit of discomfort on our part. Well, thank you all for uh, the discussion. It was great. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and close out this part with a prayer, and then we'll go ahead and get to our next speaker. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for all of the many blessings that you've given us, but thank you most of all for your son who was able to bruise the head of the serpent, to crush the head of the serpent, 
even at the cost of his own brief death. Lord, I ask that we can take these lessons, these lessons of sacrifice, and apply them to our lives. Lord, I ask that we can remember the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, what he did for us. Let us never forget that, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Thank you, Edison. Uh, that was that was outstanding. Uh, great lesson and great presentation. Um, Edison asked in his discussion about the the consequences of our sin, and, and of course, somebody mentioned one of the consequences of our sin is that Jesus had to die on the cross. But if we're not careful, sometimes we can focus on the consequences and forget about the blessings that are associated with. Uh, what Jesus did for us. And of course, somebody mentioned that one of the blessings was that uh, he paid for our forgiveness. We, we were able to obtain forgiveness because of the death of Christ on the cross. But another one is that Jesus, because of his death, and because, uh, because he bruised the head of the serpent, he gave us the opportunity to be a part of the kingdom. Uh, somebody mentioned earlier about the, the government and uh, I love our country. I think we have a great country. I think that in many ways our country has been blessed uh, as much as any other country that's ever existed on the face of the earth. But our country is not um, the supreme uh, blessing in our life, but it is another kingdom. And so I want to spend just a little bit of time tonight, the rest of our time, uh, talking about some prophecies concerning the kingdom and then uh, read about the fulfillment of that and just discuss that uh, briefly. And one of the reasons that I believe this is crucial for our lives is because if we're not careful, uh, we forget about the importance of the kingdom. And there are people in the world, and, and unfortunately even in the church, who think that the church is unimportant, that somehow the kingdom of God is not important, but that my spiritual relationship with God and my faith is what is even more important. And while it's true that our, our uh, individual relationship with God is crucial, we must not overlook the importance of the kingdom. So there are eight uh, prophets uh, in the Old Testament who prophesied the, about the kingdom. And we're not going to read all of those. We don't have time. But I want to spend just a minute looking at four of them, four Old Testament prophecies. And we'll go uh, in order of the prophecies concerning uh, the order of um, they are in the Old Testament. The first one is Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah uh, was a great prophet of God, and he said in Isaiah chapter 9 that Jesus would be called a king. And uh, in Isaiah uh, chapter 2, he prophesies, uh, this is about 750 years uh, prior to Jesus coming into the world. And I'm just going to read the first few verses, the word which Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now, it will come about that in the last days, and when Isaiah talks about the last days, he's talking about the last era of time. Uh, sometimes people talk about three dispensations, the, the patriarchal age when the fathers ruled, the Mosaic age when they lived by the law of Moses, and then the Christian age. And the Christian age would be the last days. It will come to pass about that in the last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. I want you to listen to the language that is used to describe whatever it is Isaiah is talking about here. And it will be raised above the hills. And I love the end of verse 2. And all the nations will stream into it. Some Bibles say all the nations will flow uh, into it. Um, and then he says, And many people will come and say, Come let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, and that we may walk in his path, for the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he will judge between the nations and will render decisions for many people. So uh, these verses, they're talking about a time that in Jerusalem the law of God will go forth, and in Jerusalem um, there will be established a mountain that will be higher than all the other mountains and, and a nation that will be uh, higher than all the other nations. And he says that all the nations will flow into it. Now that word all is important because 
uh, these people thought that they were God's chosen people and that they would always be God's chosen people and that everybody should always bow down to them. But God is saying there's going to come a time in the latter days when everybody will be the same and all the nations will flow into this kingdom that he is talking about. So with that in mind, turn in your Bible to Jeremiah chapter 31. And I hope you'll at least write these down or mark them in your Bible and go back and spend more time with them because we don't have as much time as I like to spend with each one. But Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 31 is going to write about a new covenant. Again, the people of Israel and Judah thought they were the people of God and God had made his covenant with them. And they held on to that covenant as if it was uh, the most important document that had ever been written. And maybe at that time it was. But look at Jeremiah 31, verse 31. Behold, days are coming. Now, just as Isaiah said, this is going to be at some point in the future. This is not now, but the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them out of the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Uh, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. What covenant is that? Well, obviously that's talking about the old law, the law of Moses. And he gave them the, the Ten Commandments. And remember when Moses came down from the mountain the first time and he was so angry because the people were worshiping idols and Aaron blamed it on the people and Moses took the tablets of stones and broke them. The covenant which they broke, Moses was symbolically showing that the people of God had already broken the, the covenant that God had given to them even as uh, it was being written. And so he broke the tablets of stone. But this is the covenant, verse 33, which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declare the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. God is saying it will not be written on tablets of stone, but it will be written on the hearts of men. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now look at verse 34. They will teach again each man his neighbor, and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. They will not teach again, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. So he's talking about when he says their neighbor, uh, that's language to describe the people who were not Jews under the Old Testament uh, law. They would talk about their neighbor, uh, not, not a person who was raised a Jew, not a person who had been proselyted as a Jew, but this is a person who was not a Jew. And they would talk about the neighbor. And God said, no longer will they have to say to their neighbor, no Jehovah, for under this new covenant, they will all know me because it'll be written on their hearts. And, and I will be a God to them, talking about the neighbors even, and I will forgive their iniquity and their sin will I remember no more. Jeremiah could not have been uh, more uh, plain. Turn now very quickly to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. I wish we had a lot more time uh, to discuss all of these, but uh, we, we have to get through these quickly. Uh, Daniel is writing about uh, a dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar was the king who had taken the Israelites into captivity, and he had this dream, and Daniel is uh, interpreting the dream. And if you look down, beginning in verse 44, uh, in the days of those kings, he's talking about, again, something in the future. This is not right now. This is going to be in the future. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. So if you were to read all of Daniel chapter 2, what you would see is that he talked about these kingdoms that would come and go. And these kingdoms would be destroyed. But in the days of those kings, the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom. It is not an earthly kingdom like all of these other kingdoms, but the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. And this is a kingdom that will never be destroyed. All other kingdoms will be destroyed. Which means, uh, just by the way, that uh, there will come a day, unless the Lord returns, that our nation, uh, the, the basis of our nation will be destroyed. Because there's no kingdom that has lasted forever and no kingdom on this earth that has been established by men will last forever. It just can't, it can't happen. And we, uh, it ought to show us the importance of this greater kingdom. Uh, he will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. 
in that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, and, uh, but it will itself endure uh, forever. So whatever this kingdom is that God is going to set up, it will be a kingdom that will last forever. And it will be above all the other kingdoms. So, so we have uh, Isaiah saying this. Uh, we have uh, Jeremiah saying this. We have Daniel saying this. And the last one is Joel, the book of Joel. Not uh, too many pages over from Daniel. Uh, Joel chapter 2. And um, I'm not going to read all of this, but this is uh, concerning a promise from God that he's going to deliver his people eventually. And verse 28, if you look at 28, it will come after this, that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. Now it's crucial that in each of these prophecies, you'll notice that, that God is saying this is what he is going to do. This is not what some man will do, but this is what God is going to do. And God says, I will pour out my spirit on all mankind, not just the Jews, but on all mankind. And your sons and daughters will prophesy, and your old men, men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. But even on the male and female service, I will pour out my spirit in those days. So those are four uh, Old Testament prophecies concerning uh, this new kingdom that will be established at some point in the future. Now, let's look at a couple of, of New Testament passages. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus is talking to his apostles and uh, he asked them in verse 13, uh, who, do, who do men say that I am? He said, what are people saying about me? And they said, some say that you're like John the Baptist and others like Elijah and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And Jesus said, uh, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him in verse 15, 16, and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. In verse 17, Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of, uh, uh, Simon Barjona, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood do not reveal this to me or to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And now look at this verse. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. So Jesus says to the apostles, I'm going to build my church. And you may say, well, uh, first of all, that's in the future. I will build. And you may say, well, what does that have to do with the kingdom? Well, look at verse 19. And I will give you the keys to the kingdom of, of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be, have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. So Jesus says that the kingdom, the church is the kingdom. And Jesus said, I'm going to build uh, my church. Well, uh, turn your Bible to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Uh, of course, in Acts chapter 2, we have recorded uh, in Acts chapter 1 how that uh, Jesus had ascended to heaven. And before he ascended, he told the apostles to go to Jerusalem and wait there and that uh, the Spirit of God would come to them, and they were to begin in Jerusalem and go to Judea and Samaria to the ends of the world. Now look at Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house. And there appeared to them tongues as a fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And now look at verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit uh, gave them voice or gave them utterance. Now, um, the people thought that these men were drunk because they were speaking in other languages. And everybody could hear them in their own language. And so Peter uh, stands up and he says in verse 14, um, Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let it be known to you this day, give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it's only the third hour of the day. That means it was nine o'clock in the morning. And Peter is saying, people don't get drunk at nine o'clock in the morning. And I'm thinking he had never been to San Francisco, <laughs> uh, because I have been, and I've seen people drunk at nine o'clock in the morning. But Peter explains, if you notice in verse 
uh, 16, and, and, and notice the connection to what we've already read, but this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And Peter quotes exactly the passage from Joel uh, chapter 2. In the last days, God will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And he says, this is, uh, one, one translation says, this is that. This is, this is the fulfillment of that prophecy. And so if it's the fulfillment of that prophecy, it is the fulfillment of uh, Daniel chapter 2, Isaiah chapter 2, Jeremiah chapter 31, Joel chapter 2, and all the other four um, uh, prophets who prophesied about the coming of the kingdom. It happened on that day, the day of Pentecost. Jesus said, I'll, I'll build my church. And Peter, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So it's not insignificant that Peter is the one who stands up and speaks in behalf of all the others because Jesus said, Peter, I'll, I'm going to let you open the door to the kingdom of heaven. With all that in mind, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Um, we, could spend, uh, we could spend an hour or two talking about Ephesians 3, but I just want to briefly um, run through some of this information with you. Uh, for this reason, I, Paul, verse 1, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you. And, and by the way, I just want to say here, uh, some of you guys who are here are going to be preachers. Some of you already are, and you're going, you're, you're going to do great work in the kingdom of God. And you're going to bless the kingdom of God for uh, many, many years to come. But I want to tell you, tonight something that I want you to consider. As a, an older a preacher, I want you to consider that if you are blessed to be a preacher, it is a gift of the grace of God, number one. And it's not a gift of God's grace for you, but it's a gift of God's grace for others. And Paul's attitude about it was, God extended this grace to me, but it is for you. And it is... Uh, it is uh, the height of, of arrogance and, and pride to think that somehow that, that the preacher is uh, more important than anybody else and that he is uh, wiser and more intelligent and more biblically astute than anybody else and that somehow he should, uh, should kind of stand up on a pedestal and he should talk down to other people. Paul said this is a gift of God's grace. And verse 3 says that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery as I wrote to you in brief. So Paul is going to tell us about a mystery. And this mystery was uh, given to Paul, he's going to tell us. And um, it was made known to him by revelation. By the way, anything that we know about salvation in our world is through revelation. There's no other way we can learn anything about salvation other than through revelation. Now we can know, according to Romans 1, 18 and following, that the, the world was created by God. We can know that without revelation. We can know that by looking at the world around us. And we can know a few things about this God by looking at the world around us. But only through revelation can we know about uh, the death of Christ uh, that Edison talked about tonight. That's the only way we can know about uh, the death of Christ and, and the consequences of our sin and the, the blessings associated with that and uh, the kingdom. The only way is through revelation. And so Paul said, I wrote about this to you briefly. Now, when did he do that? Well, some people think that Paul wrote a previous letter to the Ephesian church. He might have, but if you turn back to Ephesians chapter 1 and you look at verse, uh, uh, verse uh, 9, he's, Paul is writing and he says, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention which he purposed in him. So that could have been what Paul had in mind when he said, I wrote about it briefly to you. And then if you look at verse 4 uh, in chapter uh, uh, 3 of Ephesians, by referring to this when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. So Paul says, if you read what I'm about to write, you'll understand my insight into the mystery. Uh, now look at verse 5 which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means that, 
that even though uh, uh, Isaiah wrote about it, and Daniel wrote about it, and uh, Joel wrote about it, and Jeremiah wrote about it, they wrote about it, but they didn't understand everything that they wrote. I, I'm not even sure that they could co comprehend when they wrote about the coming of the kingdom in the latter days and a new covenant and all. There's no way they could have understood everything about that. And so Paul says in previous generations, it was not made known. Hold your finger there real quickly and turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter writes in verse 9, he says, about this, uh, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Verse 10, as to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he preached the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. So they wrote about it, but they didn't understand all about it. They had questions about it in their mind. And if you go back to Ephesians 3, hold your finger there in 1 Peter. We'll come back there in a minute. Uh, Paul says that it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. Well, who is that a reference to? Well, that's to the apostles and the writers of the New Testament. Now it has been made known to them. When Paul says it has now been made known, he doesn't mean write this a minute. He's not saying as I write these words, I just learned about this. But he's saying in this time, God has made it known uh, to the apostles and prophets, of which I was made a minister, <laughs> verse, or verse 6. Go to verse 6. To be specific, my Bible says. Um, some translations say, namely. Here it is. Here's the mystery. That the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Now notice what Paul is saying. In previous generations, people didn't understand that. It wasn't made clear to all of them. Even though Isaiah said that all the nations will flow into it. Even though Joel said that God will pour out the Spirit on all flesh. Even though Jeremiah said that you won't have to say to your neighbor anymore, no Jehovah, for they all will know him from the least and the greatest. And even though Daniel said this would be a kingdom that would destroy all the other kingdoms and a kingdom that would last forever, they didn't understand all of that. What did all of that mean? Well, Paul says, here's what it means. That the Gentiles are fellow heirs. I was in a conversation recently with a, a preacher who said that Acts chapter 2 was not for Christians. It was for the Jews only. Well, Paul says uh, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs. Not that they will become fellow heirs, but they are now. And when the Holy, the Holy Spirit of God was poured out on all flesh, and when Jesus died on the cross, he died so that the, the wall, according to Ephesians chapter 2, that wall, that middle wall of partition would be torn down. And no longer Jew or Gentiles, Galatians 3 says. But we're all one in Christ Jesus. And so Paul in Ephesians 3 verse 6 says they are uh, fellow heirs, number one. Number two, they're fellow members of the body, which means they're part of the family of God. And number three, they're fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. And if you'll turn back one page to Ephesians 1, he says down in verse uh, uh, 11, in him, talking about Christ, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. So all of this took place on the day of Pentecost. And Paul is writing to explain the fact that now it is fulfilled. It has been fulfilled. And if you look down at verse 10 of chapter 3, Paul says, So that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known uh, through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. The manifold wisdom of God would be made known through the church. Now we know that it's through the church that the world's going to learn about the kingdom. But that's not what Paul is saying here. He says, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God, the, the many splendored wisdom of God would be made known to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. That's the angels in heaven. What does that mean? That means when, when the angels in heaven see what's going on down here on the earth, when somebody is baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of sins, you know what the angels do? The Bible says they're rejoicing in the midst of the angels in heaven, and the angels look down and they say, is it God wise? Is it God wise? 
And by the way, the wisdom of God is always, don't miss this, the wisdom of God is always better than the wisdom of men. Amen. Always better. And we never have a right to say, well, I think this is better, or I like this, and I don't mean to be ugly, but it doesn't matter what you think, or what I think, or what I like. We have to follow the wisdom of God. And he says in verse 11 that this was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus. Now, last verse, 1 Peter chapter 1. After, he talks about the outcome of the salvation of your souls. And the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries. Look at verse 12. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Now look at this. Things into which angels long to look. The angels are interested in what's going on right here, right now. And every time Brother Matt comes up here and preaches the gospel of Christ, the angels are looking down and they're saying, isn't God wise? And every time the elders lead the way that they should, uh, the angels are looking down and they're saying, isn't God wise? And every time um, the church works together in unity and harmony, the angels are looking down saying, isn't God wise? And every time a, a husband treats his wife the way that he should and a wife treats her husband the way that she should and parents raise their children the way that they should, the angels are looking down saying, isn't God wise? And every time you show the world what it means to be a Christian by the way that we live our lives, the angels are looking down and they're saying, isn't God wise? We should give thanks every day of our lives. For the beautiful, manifold wisdom of God. Let's pray together. Father, we are thankful that in your infinite wisdom that you saw fit to, to record for us the prophecies that were made hundreds of years before Jesus came into this world concerning not only his, his death and his life and his resurrection and his second coming, but also concerning his kingdom. And Father, we help us to rejoice every day if we are part of that kingdom. And may we never forget that it is the kingdom that is the most important of all organizations that we're a part of in our lives. And it is the kingdom that cannot be destroyed even by the gates of hell. And it is a kingdom that will last as long as the world stands. And we're grateful that someday that Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, will take the kingdom in his hand. And he will present it to you. And it will then be without spot or without blemish. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen.
He's a spy. Okay. Russ, come on, some of the older guys. What'd you learn? Jesus' resurrection? When Jesus died. When Jesus, you got it. You got it. Order crew, come on. What did you guys learn about? Do you guys at least tell me the theme? You got it. We learned about prophecy. Come on. Guys and Darcy, you guys know what the theme is? Our theme today is fulfilled. All right, fulfilled. What has been written has come true. All right, so we're going to be talking about the prophecies about Jesus. Now I'll take a first one. Thank you. <laughs> so we're going to be learning about the prophecies of Jesus. All right, so the, throughout the course of this week, that's where our main focus will be on. All right. Is that good? All right. All right, everybody say thank you, Sacred, for being seen today. Thank you, guys. All right, we look forward to having you guys back here tomorrow night at 6 for another great night of BBS with another great song leader like Sacred. Some more great lessons from some of our students and Brother Jeff. Yeah, I love that. Let's get it. Woo! Woo! All right. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for being here tonight. We love you all. And again, Jesus... Everything they said about him has come true. We can trust him, we can put our faith in him, and he loves you. All right, Jason, would you mind close this up and pray? Let's pray. Dear Lord God in heaven, we come to you today thankful for everything you've blessed us with. We're thankful for the opportunity to praise and we glory to your name and to teach others about you. We pray that everyone will walk out of here more spiritually edified than they were before they walked in. And we pray that he, you can grant everyone safe travel as they head home today. And in Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, good night, everybody. Be safe, God at home. High five. High five. High five. High five. High five.